picks that are closing today. Hallelujah. I don't know if you watch a lot of the Olympics or not. Uh, I did not watch as much as I would have liked. I wish I would have seen more, but it was too late at night and or too early, uh, too too late in the morning. So, but the parts that I have seen, I re it really inspired me and I really enjoyed it. Last week in the closing of the message, we looked at a video and the the father of the modern Olympics, um, uh, Pierre de Cour Coubertin. Coubertin was talking about uh, the importance of Christian being uh, fit physically and getting involved in, in sport as something that would benefit our spiritual life as well. And he was uh, referring to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul is saying about himself, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I remain faithful. And this is a foundation uh, for many of the texts of the New Testament about fighting, running, and continuing the race that God has set before us. Hallelujah. And there are so many, many texts in the New Testament that links Olympics, athletes, uh, sports events with our Christian lives. So we should wonder why has the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the New Testament to write so much about this theme, the, 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 to excel, to, to strive, to fight, to run in this. So I want to look at the next uh, slide on slide number two and look at the words in bold. There is many texts like that throughout the New Testament that you will find. Keep yourself in training for godly life. Physical exercise compared to spiritual exercise. Which one is the more valuable? Uh, we struggle, we work hard, uh, we give our time, we give our efforts. And also notice that it has to do with our conduct, faith, and purity. So it has to do with our daily life. It has to do with the kind of life that we live in the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Do not neglect. There is something that God has invested in us. So neglecting your training, neglecting your spiritual exercises will have an effect on your life. Practice these things. Devote yourselves to them so that there will be a progress. You see, when you start something, either training at the gym or you start running or you start small, there will be a progress. You will start maybe to lose weight. You will feel better. It will affect the way that you, uh, your, your motivation to eat better. Like it, it changed. There will be a progress. And this progress will be seen by people and people will, will ma make comments about that. And then watch yourself. Keep on doing these things. And because it's, it has to do with what? Salvation. Your salvation. And the salvation of people around you. Because your life impacts. Your life has a great uh, influence over other people, whether you realize it or not. If you are successful as a Christian, if you shine the light, if you display the love of Jesus, they will touch people a lot. So these texts has a lot to do as an encouragement to us to, and it comes from illustration, from athletes, from, from fighting. Let's go to the, the, main, the main text to the, the slide, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, 27. This is a very, very strong text by Paul, and it, uh, it, it, says, it says so much to us about receiving the prize uh, uh, in a race all the runners run. You and I today, we are the runners. We are running. All of us in this room are running. Even people who are not in this room are running also. We are running the most important race. We are running from earth to our eternal destiny. That is the reality. That's why these texts are so, so, so important. Because these becomes the reason why the Holy Spirit has inspired the, the writer of the New Testament to use so much of these texts for a comparison and linking it to our, our Christian life. It's that they will become, the life of these athletes will become physical and visual illustration about the race that we are running from earth to heaven. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Only a few of you believe, but that's okay. I hope that by the end of the message, you will believe more. So that the, 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 the message this morning is that you and me, you have to run to win. Because if you don't run, are you going to win? No. So that's, that's very clear. In a race, all the runners run. And you are exhorted this morning very strongly by Paul, run to win. Don't just run, stroll around in the park, or run sloppy, without discipline, run to the left or run to the right. Actually, there, there is a, an athlete uh, in one of the uh, race this week. I think it, he was to be the, 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 the bronze medal. But in the corridor, when he, when he ran, he went beyond the line and sideline. And he was going to win. But he was disqualified at the number four, became the number three, and won the, the bronze medal. So the way that you run, you have to run according to the rules. You have to, to run to win and be disciplined in the way that, that, you, that you run. See these young men and women. Look at their training. Look at their self-sacrifice. Look at how they sprint, they run, they box, they wrestle. And the point of this this morning is that they are aiming at the day when they come to the podium and they receive this prize that they have strived for four years. Some of them started as children, some of them started as teenagers. They went to university, they were training, they didn't have a social life. They did everything so that they would one day climb the podium and receive this honor and representing their country. Imagine how it is wonderful. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit this morning to you and to me is to when you look at the podium, when you look at these athletes, their suffering, their self-training and sacrifice and going to the podium, think of you when you will go to a much greater podium when you will receive from the hand of a much greater referee or judge or representative, when you will receive from the hand of Jesus Christ himself, your reward, your podium. Look at the next slide. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. This is serious this morning. This is important. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of each and everyone in this room this morning. I pray that even though these texts are so familiar, that it will revive a vision, a destination, a sense of direction, Lord. Oh God, hallelujah. Do it for all of us this morning. First, uh, the second Corinthians 5, 9. That's why Paul says, we make it therefore our ambition. This has become our goal to us. This should be your goal. Is it, is it your goal? When, when, you, when you live, I mean, yes, we think about it. We know it in theory, but it, is it really to be acceptable to him? And then this is from the Amplified Version. For we believers will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. That is quite significant. This is clear. There will be a day where you and I, we will appear before this podium. This is called the Bema Seat, the Judgment Seat of Christ. Many of you have heard it if you've been in the church a long time. This is called the Bema Seat, means a step, a raised platform, where in Greek towns there were public speeches, decisions from the court of the city rulers were being held down to the population from that platform in Greek towns. It was also the same terminology used when athletes at the old Greek Olympics would receive the, 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 the red, the perishable red at the time. They would receive it. So it's used for, for both illustration. And actually, this word will appear before it's not exactly significant. It's not deep enough for you this morning. Because appear, it's like, okay, I'll give you an example. I go to the medical clinic. Open the door. Hi, doctor. I have this problem. Okay. I appear before the doc. Then the doc says, okay, you have a problem. He brings me to the x-rays. 
and he examined me inside with the x-rays. It goes deep inside my bones, my muscles, and everything. And then he will see what's the problem. Is two kind of appearing. One is just, oh, hi, I appear. I'm here, hello. And the second one is like to come into the presence and being looked at inside. That is the word used here in this one. It's a day of revelation. That's why this Bible version here says it's so much better. We must all have our lives laid open before Jesus Christ on that day. Our lives will be laid open. And this is, this is what it says, we believers will be called into account. This is a place of revelation. And everything about you, the way you, you run that race that God has set before you, is going to be evaluated. She used the word judge, but it's actually an evaluation, a searching in your deepest part of your life. Whether you are really loving Jesus or you are running the race, the quality, not only the quantity of your service, but the quality, the motive, the reasons why you're doing what you're doing, the reason why you are neglecting, the reason why you are in full devotion and full sprint, the, the reason why you serve with, with all of your energy, with faith, with vision, with obedience, everything will be searched inside before the throne of Jesus Christ. The character of our service will become so, so clear. Amen? Amen. So this has become a very important text to all of us because this is an illustration for you. Amen? Amen. This is for you. This is for me this morning. Let's go, to, uh, go forward to number five. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 9 verse 24, 27. And the race all runners run, but one will receive the prize. So run that you may obtain it. As we said, we're all running the race of life. But we run differently. Everybody in this room here, we have different personality, different approach, different concept, different faith, uh, different motives. Uh, we, we run differently. Some of us maybe run, we're still professed professed Christian, not really, but yes, we go to church, but we are not really devoted, or we may serve half-heartedly. Some of us may be pretending, maybe we say Sunday Christians, but the rest of the week we are, you know, running on our own, on our things. We, we don't know, we run differently. But the text here, I think, is clear that not everybody will win the prize, which makes it very serious, don't, don't you think so? It's about winning or not winning the eternal prize, the unperishable prize. And here it brings us, like Paul says, that's why I don't run aimlessly. This is why I discipline my body, I keep it under control, not to be disqualified. Oh, wait a minute. Can Paul be disqualified? Could Paul have been disqualified? We know he hasn't been because he said at the end he has finished his race. He's fought the fight. He's run to the end. He's remained faithful. Could have Paul been disqualified? Yes. Do you know pastors that have been disqualified? Do you know? That's what Paul says. Even I, a preacher, could end up being disqualified. So there is this reality, this potential possibility in our lives and that's why this analogy of disqualification is very important. You know what this word means? Disqualified means unapproved, uh, rejected, failed to meet the test. And actually if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, don't look there now, but you will see that in many Bible versions, this is exactly the translation of the same word, fail to meet the test or fail the test. And Paul goes from that sentence and to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. We go to the next slide. And there is a continuity of thought. He says, so that I might not be disqualified or find myself reprobate. For I do not want you to be ignorant. There is a conjunction of unity. It continues the text here. So that I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact of your ancestors, Israel. Look at Israel. They were called into an Olympic. 
This is an Olympic training camp. We've talked many, many weeks about the book of Leviticus. God called them out of Egypt, brought them here, and revealed so many things to, to him. So, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that they went through the sea. They were baptized in Christ. They ate of the spiritual food. And it lists a lot of spiritual uh, symbolism declaring very clearly that Israel at that time had been called to run the race. Were they running the race? Yes. But what is the point of this text? They have all been disqualified. If you look a little bit further, you will see that nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. That is sad, because they were called not to be overthrown. They were called to be overcomers. They were called to be God's representative. They were called to be in fellowship with God. They were called to be a representation to the world of, of the God of the universe, the Creator. This is, they were called, and they were trained, and they were sent to run that race. But we read, according to Paul here, that many of them have not been pleasing the Lord and they were disqualified. And this is the purpose of that, that, that text, the connection between chapter 9 and chapter 10. Paul says, so that I will not be disqualified because moreover, brothers and sisters, I want you to see the, the point that I want to make. Look at Israel as an illustration of the possibility of all of us being disqualified of the possibility of it. That's not what God has for us. So now these things took place as example for us. Again, the point of illustration, the point of comparison. Look at these athletes. Look at these runners who came before you. Look at their victories. Look at their defeat. Look at everything that has happened to them and learn from it. This has been given to us as an example. Their success, their defeat, depend on how they have been contending for the prize. And you know, in this ex example here, the, the problem, and that will come to all of us also, very important. That's why Paul says, I discipline my body. I keep it under control. Why? Because here in that text, they did not control their body impulse and their passions. And we are exhorted and reminded not to be like them. They follow the desire of their bodies. Look at verse 7 and 8. They sat down eating, drinking. When it says drinking, they were not drinking milk. They were drinking something else which turns into wild partying, depending on which Bible version you are reading, which led to sexual immorality. There's a progression here. So you, you, you let your body rule your life. You just go into whatever your body uh, wants. They didn't control. I was at the gym recently with a, a trainer, and uh, he is a manager, actually who had been through a drug rehab here in Hong Kong. And one of the reasons why he has been to this drug rehab is that a few years ago, before he went, the very first Friday night that he had attended a meeting to the drug rehab center, I was a speaker. He told me that. Bridget was with me. And he says, I heard your testimony. And because of what you said of your past, how God has helped you, I decided that I would go into the training. And he has been into this training. Now he is a manager at the gym. And then I'm asking with him, well, we, we've been talking quite a lot recently. So I'm very happy. I've been touched that he told me that. You never know what God, how God can, can use you. So he says, uh, he's not going to church. He has also told me yesterday that he knows some friends that have been through the drug rehab problem, uh, pro program and they return into drugs. And he's quite concerned by that because he feels weak. So I was challenging him. So do you go to church? No, I don't go to church. I'm too lazy. But actually, it's, I understand. He, you know, he's working six hours, uh, 12 hours a day, six days a, six days a week. So he's working and he's tired. Sunday morning, you, know, you just don't feel to wake up at 6 o'clock, run to church. So he's tired. So he stays home. He doesn't have a fellowship. He doesn't hear what you hear every week. He doesn't have the support of that. 
he doesn't read this Bible. He says, I'm lazy, I don't read my Bible. Okay. And then he says, he asked me yesterday, do you, because he knows my past, are you tempted by drugs sometime? Are you thinking about it? I says, no, I don't. Because when God touched me many years ago, I was miraculously delivered. So I've never been tempted. I didn't have to fight it. I didn't have to try to stop. I was delivered. So I said, no, I, I don't have this problem. So he says, me, I have. I'm thinking about it sometime. I'm tired. And sometimes I drink, he says. And then I was pointing to the Olympics. I says, look. Look at the Olympics. You, you, you're working in the gym. Look at the Olympics. What, what kind of sacrifice, what kind of training do you go to? Be careful. And then I, I quoted these this progressions. I says, look, eating, drinking, drinking will make your uh, resistance make, make you weak. Then you're tired, you're weak. Temptation of drugs comes. You will be weak in a weak state. It's dangerous for you to fall again. You need to find a way to strengthen that. Don't go into this way. So uh, I was using this exercise, I mean this ex illustration to, to help him to understand, hey, come on, be careful, be serious about your life. It's important. God took you out of that. Don't go back. Don't go back to that. Look at these guys here below. I think you all know the stories if you follow the, the Olympics. This is a very sad story for the Rio Olympic this year. These American runner, uh, Miss Wimmer, they won gold medals. They are the best of the best in the whole world. But they went to the bar. They went drink, par printing, uh, partying, drinking. Same thing as what we read. They, they yielded, you know, they finished their test. Now they have the, the gold medal so that they can relax. They can release, you know, they are free now. They can do whatever they want. So now they are listening and yielding to the passion, the impulse. Let's go party. We won a gold medal. It's over. We're going to the U.S. tomorrow or something like that. Let's, let's have a, a, a Rio de Janeiro party, you know. And they did. And then they, they broke something. They made a lie. They, they accused the, the people to have you know, put a gun on their head and everything. And they became in disgrace. So now they're going back to the U.S. What do you think their life will be like? They were going to win tons and tons of money for publicity with all of the cereal box or milk or any health products or Adidas or Nikes. Or they were going to make tons and tons of money. You think these companies want to have these guys now? You know, they won the gold medal. But what will they be remembered for? Not for the gold medal, but for the disgrace. Paul is warning all of us about it. You and I, we have to run to win because this is winning or losing. It is winning or not winning, and we're talking eternity. This is a race to eternity. And I think that after years of walking the Christian life, it is easy to, to yield and to abandon and to go into the weakness of our, of our body and listen to our body. Verse 24. Let's go to the next slide. All the runners run, but only one received the prize. So run that you may obtain it. So here the point is, it's not that only one person in this room will win the prize. So I must beat you all and win the prize and you will lose the prize because I will be the only one winning. That is not what it says. It's, it's a call to all of us as individual responsibility. You, 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 you run to win. That is all of us win. But one very beautiful example that I have seen in the Olympics is these three girls here. Wow. Wonderful ladies. Brianna Rollins, Naya Ali, and Christy Castlins. Three American runner, 100 meters hurdles. You know what I have really liked about these girls before the run, before the race, just minutes before the race? I, the, the camera showed them. They were just before they, they went to take their, their position and start the race. They were holding hands close by, their heads down. They were praying together in unity. 
she is the fastest runner. They won gold, silver, and bronze. They were praying, they support her, and then when you read their story more, you will find that they are genuinely true friends and truly caring for one another. And I think this is the best illustration of what the body of Christ ought to be like. I want you to win. You want me to win. It's important. Because if I don't win and I fall in disgrace, I'm disgracing you as well. We are running together. So we, we are in it together. When we look at Payatas and the Philippines, this is Lighthouse Hong Kong that is supporting that. When you look at all of our sisters and the work that is being done and all, everything, all the missions of our small church is doing all over the world and the people that have been touched through 25 years of, of history, this is us together. This is what God has been doing and continues to do. So you run, and soon your children are going to run also with you. They are already starting to run. I think Pastor Fayez told me that his son wants to be baptized. So he's preparing to run that race. He's, he looks at his parents. He's been touched by, the, by uh, his life. And he says, I want to run that race. Dad, I want to run that race. I want to start. I know starting point starts with baptism because that's the declaration, public declaration of my faith. I want that in my life. Isn't that beautiful? We are going to have all, all of these. And this is such a, a wonderful story. Verse 25. Okay, continue. Verse 25, every athlete exercise self-control. Oh, no, not that word. <laughs> this is not a word that we like. Because it's by self-control sounds like um, a prison or like diminutive or something that, a restriction, that's the right word. Self-control. Of what? For what? I want to have fun. I want to do my life. I want the full package. I want to do what my friends are doing. I want to, you know, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. <laughs> Not self-control. Who wants self-control? Nobody likes this verse. They do it. But these guys, these ladies, these young people, they do it. They do it for a perishable crown, for a perishable. You know, I was reading that most of the athletes, after they won whatever prize it is, national, international, or even the Olympics, you know where their medals end up? They end up, many of them, in, in a drawer at home. The event is over. So life goes on. Maybe they have working, they, have prof they are professional and other things, or their life goes on. What are they going to do with their medal? They are not carrying around their neck every day of their life. <laughs> so that medal needs to be stored somewhere. So open the drawer, put it there. And that is, you know, this, the, the, since childhood or teenage years, that has been their self-control, discipline. Paul says, I discipline my body. I do not run aimlessly. What is self-control anyway? How does it work? How do you get it, self-control? What's the usefulness of self-control? Any serious athletes has a training program. Actually, in a TV commercial, there was a close-up on, on some of the athletes. One of them says, I haven't had dessert in two years. Wow, how sad. <laughs> the other one says, I haven't watched TV since last summer. So it was the summer after. So one year I haven't watched TV, I didn't have time. If you look at the next slide, you have an example of another, one of the most decorated American female Olympics, Jenny Thompson. She won 10 uh, Olympics medal and eight golds in swimming. If you read her story here, this, uh, she, did, she, she shows what was her training, her self-control one. She talks about w waking up under the adrenaline going, running everything she has to do and one day had to go through. She was a student in medicine at university. 
Can you imagine? She became this wonderful athlete while she was studying at university level and medicine. Have you ever tried to study in medicine at university? Go and try it. <laughs> If you last one week, you will be very, very good. So she did her degree in medicine as she was training there. So she said she had to uh, go work out two hours before the day started, then triple espresso to get, get en energy for the day, then head to the library and study the entire day. I'd go swim in the evening because there's no more time, and then go back to studying all night. My day started at 7 a.m. and did at 1 a.m. I didn't have any social life. I barely had time to eat and go to the bathroom. That's the discipline. That's the self-control of that. And if you look at all the other uh, athletes mentioned here, you will see a tremendous uh, effort, self-discipline, diet. You know, these guys and ladies, they have psychologists, they have coach, they have all sorts of massage, they have all s many different style of coach, for some for their specialty, some for, for building up the, their strength, the muscular strength, and different, and different things. That's how they prepare for a perishable prize. All their lives are immersed in their respective sports. What is your life immersed in? What are the things that fill your mind and your worries that you are, you know, the, the absorbed and immersed in all the time? Has a thought of eternity get into your mind lately? I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Paul is talking about a new way of, a new sport in a way here, a boxer. Did you know that Hudson Taylor, before he went to China, the great missionary, one of the greatest missionary of all time, studied in medicine. He also studied Chinese. And he moved to inner city, the poorest district of town, so that he could harden his body. He slept on a wooden board, no mattress, willingly. He chose that. How many would like that? You choose that. He chose what he ate, the poorest food of all. Why did he do that? Because he knew, I'm going to China. It's going to be so hard. If I don't train myself right now, I won't make it. I heard a pastor says, I have some of my youth, they come to me and says, Pastor, I want to be a missionary. But he says, they cannot even get out of bed before 12 o'clock. <laughs> You will never make it as a missionary. So Hudson Taylor prepared for, for his life. You know, I, I don't want to, to boast about something, but I felt it was the Holy Spirit leading me before I moved to Hong Kong and the year and a half that I prepared myself. I was led by God to fast for 40 days. I did it because the Lord was helping me. I did not realize exactly, but I felt this urgency. I felt this need, and I did it because... I, I wanted to. Nobody forced me. I did not follow a, a fast from the church. The pastor uh, told everybody, I felt this is something I need to do. I was preparing to move my family out of Canada to Hong Kong. And I felt this was important as a preparation. And I knew that God has done a great, great work. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest revivalist in the US, analyzed his heating habits. And he has discovered that certain food and his diet would give him a headaches. And he decided that he would never eat this food anymore because it would hinder his spiritual life. Is there something in your spiritual life that hinders you? Is there any dis destruction, distraction, something that steals you and that it would be easy in a way? No, I, I'm deciding. I'm, I'm, I'm saying no to that. And you say, Pastor, are you preaching legalism and ascetism this morning? Go back to Titus chapter 2, verse 10, 11. The grace of God has appeared, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. That's the grace of God that says, that appears and teaches us. So it's not by, by ascetism. Because Paul says about a, a, a citizen, this is, this is what he has to, to, to say. Let me see if I can find it again. Yes. Harsh treatment of the body may show an appearance of wisdom and humility, 
but it has no real value in controlling physical passion. It only looks spiritual. It only looks as wisdom, like, oh, this person, oh, you, you see? You see this guru in India, he's on the mountain under the tree, and he's like meditating all day long. He looks so holy. But it has no real value in spiritual life at all. What I'm talking about this morning is the power of Jesus Christ living inside of you by the Holy Spirit, who energizes you and creates in Christians new ambitions, higher goals, more nobles in the sense of directions, godly ambitions and, and desire. Brothers and sisters, do you see any trace of, Olympi of being Olympians in all of us today? Uh, when it comes to our spiritual life, do we see, do we see that? If, listen to that, if in the spiritual, you are to be compar comparable to these athletes and the physical who gets the prize, in the spiritual, you are to be comparable to, the, to them and the physical because they run for the prize. What does your life look like? If you are supposed to be comparable to them in the spiritual, is it true? Do you see, do you see that? You see, and I want to close with that. God may not call us to, you know, try the Olympics. I don't, I don't think that many, many of us would, would fit a few soccer players in the room here this morning. I don't know if you can compete for the Olympics. I doubt that. Oh, by the way, there was also a special team uh, for the first, very first time at the Rio Olympics. They were the refugee teams. And if you look about the story of these people, I've read also some of the stories of former refugees who have won medals at the Olympics after having from South Sudan. They have been adopted by American families and the photo taken with President Bush and Mrs. Bush and uh, representing the country uh, of the US. Starting from South Sudan, you know what they did? They ran. They ran the Olympics for their life. They ran from South Sudan to Kenya. And then they lived, I don't know how many years, and to the Kenyan uh, refugee camp before, by God's grace and God's miraculous plan, they had been adopted in the U.S. to end up winning a gold medal in the Olympics. What a great God we have. What a great God we have. He knows how to inspire us. You may not be called to, to for the Olympics this morning, but God calls each one of us to run the most important race of all from earth to heaven for an imperishable uh, prize. That's what it is all about. Run. Look at their lives. Learn from them and run. That's the message that we have for you this morning. In a sprint, you need to go fast. That's the quality, speed. But you and I, we are, we are in a long distance race. It's long. It's long. And a long distance race, a marathon, endurance is the key. There are two critical moments in long distance running. The first one is the start. You start. It's long distance. So you start. <laughs> And then you want to go faster, you want to go faster. If you go too fast, you will not finish. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we, if you have seen the long distance running, some of them, they are the leader. And in the last turn, yeah. <laughs> the others just pass them by. Because they gave too much energy, they started too fast. Have you ever seen Christians or n new people coming to the church, and you look at their zeal and their enthusiasm, you think they will save the world? And many of them are not even in the church today. Or they have diminished, they have went down, and now they are dragging their feet at the end of, of, of all the, the, the runners. They are at the end. They're too tired. They cannot do it. Oh, it's too hard to live the Christian life. They went out. So starting is important. But also I feel this morning, I want to, to call your attention to that. The most critical time is the half point, half, halfway point when you realize 
that you have already been far, so far, but it's only halfway. And you're tired. You have already given all your best. You've already given all of your energy and you're only at the end. How can I make it to the end? Already so long. The runners call it hitting a wall. And I think, I, I was, I'm, as a pastor, sometimes I'm wondering what is happening in the life of some of the church members. Because you know the potential that some of you have. And it's not there anymore. It has been. I remember a few years. I've been here 25 years already. So that's a long time in Lighthouse. So you, you have seen a few people passing by in the church. So you have seen people who were in a certain way, and they are not in a certain way anymore. Some of them were here. Some of them are not here anymore. So you see, you see people who have shown extreme zeal. You have seen people who have shown extreme qualities and skills and some things and usefulness, but at some point, it's not there anymore, or sadness. And I know that there's a lot of things happening in a lifetime, in 25 years. Disappointment, I'm sure I have disappointed some of you. I am sure my personality has offended some of you. I've said something at the wrong time. I have lack sensi sensitivity, at, uh, you know, or lack of wisdom or something. I'm sure I have been the cause of some of you or something. Uh, or somebody else, uh, somebody talked against you, or money problems, life problems, work problems, uh, something, the pressure of life. You are hitting the wall. You have approached God at some point in the past with all of your enthusiasm and determination, and you have made God all sorts of promise. Use me, Lord, I'm yours, Lord. Do anything, I'll do anything for you, Lord. Have you ever done that prayer? I'm sure many of you have done that, and seriously, and you meant it, but you are not living that right now. Because life is like that. You are running a marathon and you have hit the wall. And you've come at the end of your endurance and you're not sure you can put one more foot in front. But still, it's not about me, it's not about the church, it's not about anybody. It's about God has called you to run to win because it's about eternity, is it? So I want to, uh, closing the next slide just uh, quickly, Click the next one. I want to just introduce to encourage those of you who have hit the wall. Uh, Becky James from the uh, Britain, Britain um, winner, Olympic winner, 24 years old. She won the cycling silver. You see, why are you bothering us with it's only a silver medal this morning? What's so special about her? Because in 2014, which is only two years before the Olympics, she had been having a cervical cancer treatment. That's what's special. She had been a cycling Olympic and the British, British Cycling Olympics program since she was 15. So at 22 years old, she had a cervical cancer treatment. After the operation, one week after, she started to compete again to have a problem with her knee. Then after that, she had an operation in her shoulder. You say, if it's me, I would not have a silver. I would just have look at the reality of my body says, this is impossible. I'm not going to run that race. I'm not going to cycle. It's, I'm not going to the Olympics. I only have, what, one, one year to, to, you know, to, to recover or something? It's impossible. But she did it. So that's what is special. So if you have hit a wall in your life, is, is there enough power in God to lift you up this morning? To call your attention by the Holy Spirit to these wonderful athletes. See their success. See their defeat. See the encouragement. See the warnings. And then, run. What's the message? Run. Run. Can you run this morning for God? 
with you stand. Hallelujah.